Imagine doing that. We are going to build this amazing little MP3 player. We're not going to research it, we're just going to do it. And that's the genius of Apple's product design. My name is Michael Johnson. I run a design company here in Clapham called Johnson Banks. So years ago, we just used to start designing and get on with it. But then we realized that we weren't always getting the brief right. I had to think harder about the steps that I go through. These are the five and a half steps that I use to get the best results in our branding projects. First of all, we investigate. We find out where someone sits in a market. The second stage, is to think about the strategy, the narrative that lies behind the brand. The third stage is design, when we're designing brand identities, but there's a stage in between. How the brand fits together, the names they use, that we call stage 2.5. The fourth stage is getting a really great design idea and implementing it well. The fifth stage is making sure that that percolates down across an organisation, or we might be reviving them, taking it into its next lease of life. So those are the five and a half stages that I'm going to refer to a little today. I thought it'd be really interesting to talk about Patagonia. Yvonne Chouinard, he was a climber and he started making climbing equipment. But then he discovered this climbing equipment that he was making was actually having a destructive effect. Then though, they made a huge strategic decision to switch. I think Patagonia is one of the first to really understand how human beings' relationship with the environment and our planet is something that needs to be treasured. And yeah, there are quite a few people trying to get in on this, but the reason why customers can see through this is because you can't just get on the purpose bandwagon. In the 1980s, Patagonia was getting into how you could recycle 25 bottles and make that into a fleece. They've turned environmental activism into a marketing approach. Whereas the visual brand, isn't that great? That's a fairly clunky piece of typography, but it stayed. Even if it's not perfect, maybe don't mess with your brand because eventually it will come back into fashion. If we think about how the Patagonia story kind of relates to the things I was talking about in this book, he investigated the problem. Then really in the second stage of the process, the strategy and narrative stage, he wrote the proto-guideline for a purpose-driven brand, the why are we here? Because then you have that kind of North Star as long as you stay in the direction of where you want to go, it can be incredibly powerful. The London Underground story starts here. At the turn of the century, the, the boss is thinking, isn't it interesting when you go to Paris and you can see these words kind of punch out of this, these blue tiles? We really like that. The initial design was the white words on a blue background. They start to realise that this isn't quite right and what they would like is a way of writing underground that is a little bit more unique. So the powers that be commissioned a chap called Edward Johnston to design a 20th century typeface. So without serif, the next thing that starts to happen is the design starts to change over the years. We start to get towards the version of the symbol that we all know and has defined what we think of as modern transport. Transport for London have been sort of at the vanguard of creating a kind of corporate style. And you do that by letting people play with your corporate elements. What really helps is when you say to a famous graphic designer, you can put our symbol in the bottom of a tiger. Why not? I would love them to get back to the kind of joie de vivre, if you like, of the design of the 30s, the 40s and 50s and the 80s. In terms of the five and a half steps, I think this is a great example of three, four and five. So the design of it, the implementation, the idea keeping going, the ability to engage with the typography and revive the typography. It maybe seems a bit obvious to talk about Apple, but it, it, the Apple story is really interesting. There's the product story, but then there's also the brand identity. So many of the product innovations were not based on research. Research will only guarantee mediocrity and will only work out whether you're going to offend anyone. Imagine doing that. We are going to build this amazing little MP3 player. We're not going to research it, we're just going to do it. The truth is, though, that they were very, very, and still are very canny marketeers because they would look at a market, and there might even be people in this market already, but we can just do that better. If we go back to the very, very early days, they realised that they could create an interface 
that was, you know, had charming and had these famous little symbols on it. And they found a way for people to have a relationship with their computer that they could never have before. And that's the genius of Apple's product design. I think in terms of the five and a half steps, I've a pretty good example of across the board. In the sense of the first stage, what they've always been genius at is looking hard at our market and finding gaps. And then writing strategy and narrative well, funnily enough, they were not always the leaders on that, but when they did things like the manifestos, then you can see how they defined what they stood for. The graphic design has been secondary. Probably most importantly, the implementation and re-engaging and re-energizing the brand. They've just been able to do that and keep doing that to the point where they can just put an Apple symbol next to a word and that's enough. That, if you like, is the holy grail for brands. I think in a way it's a classic case study. You can pretty much pick out anything you want out of the branding process from the Apple Store.